Welcome, everybody, to another Jump Music <laughs> Initiative podcast. Uh, we have a very special guest with us today. Um, Richard Devine is an Atlanta-based electronic musician and sound designer. He's recognized for producing a layered and heavily processed sound, um, combining influences from glitch music to old and modern electronic music. Uh, he's worked on projects for Google, BMW, Apple, Sony Media, um, and many more. Uh, he has contributed uh, sound design to a number of hardware and software manufacturers, and he recently released his first official sample library through Sony Creative Software, entitled The Electronic Music Manuscript, a Richard Divine Collection. Thank you so much for joining us, Richard. No problem. Um, so can we just start at the beginning? Can you tell us what was your way into music uh, from the beginning, uh, uh, what was your first instrument or, or how did you get your start? Uh, that would be going back all the way to, I would say seven or eight years old when my mom signed me and my brother up for piano lessons that we didn't want to do at the time. <laughs> um, you know, as a seven, eight year old, you want to do, you know, what eight year olds do, ride on your BMX bike, playing the creek with catch poisonous snakes, do all that kind of sort of things. Um, we really didn't have that much of interest in music at the beginning. Um, it was more just something my mother wanted us to do to be more well-rounded. And so I went through multiple piano teachers and stuff like that. And um, wasn't really, it wasn't really sticking. It wasn't until um, it was one of, one of the last piano teachers I had who was, um, had a whole different approach to teaching. It wasn't just all about proper etiquette and, you know, reading. I was just basically doing sight reading and, um, you know, just playing these uh, pieces to, to play in a recital. Um, you know, they would have recitals and stuff like that. And, you know, and it was, you know, at the time I was really more interested in, um, you know, like I said, other things, but um, the last piano teacher I had before I, I stopped taking piano lessons, he, he basically asked me this really profound question. And it's like, well, why are you taking piano lessons? Is it because, is it because your mom's making you? And I'm like, yeah, basically it is like, well, you shouldn't be taking piano lessons because your mom is making you take piano lessons. You should be taking, you should be wanting to learn this because you want something out of it and you, you enjoy it. It brings you enjoyment. It's, it's mm -hmm. you get some emotional feedback from it that does something for you very much like you do when you're riding your bike or if you're doing something else that you like to do it should be one of those things that you shouldn't be forced into doing because you're never going to really enjoy it and i was like you know that you're right so his approach was to play play multiple pieces of music from all these different composers he's like well i'm going to just play you some things and then you tell me what you like and then what, if you like something we'll learn how to play that and and, and this was such a it was the first piano teacher where you know presented this concept of like oh yeah you know you should really love and like what you do or you're never going to go anywhere and do anything if your heart's not really in it and that's with anything it doesn't mean it, it doesn't necessarily have to be music but as an eight-year-old having an eight-year-old brain that was such a profound idea to me at the time I was like yeah you're right I should like this stuff and so he just started playing music our lessons became him playing all these different composers everyone from Beethoven to Haydn to Schmidt to um, to Eric Satie, I learned all of these, this, this, not just classical music, but jazz, all these different forms of music that I wasn't aware of before. And it really opened my, that's when my ears started to open up and perk out and go, oh, okay, there are some interesting things that are happening here that I actually like, that I, now I want to participate and, and look into this further. So it kind of, that was like my initial first early beginnings of, of being interested in music and wanting to partake and like learn more about it. And as, as I got older, um, I started taking up guitar lessons. I also took up drum lessons, bass lessons. Uh, my mom got me into all sorts of other stuff. So I got all uh, more equipment. And then um, as I got older and I got involved with skateboarding, skateboarding was also a big part of it early on and a lot of the music that came with skateboarding uh, was pretty heavily influential for me which was a lot of like thrash metal hip-hop um and um a lot of diy punk music at the time was really big so yeah i loved that i kind of was like this just sponge that was just absorbing all of these different forms of music at the time now that i was like interested in it and wanting to play instruments and that sort of got my initial beginnings like 
into the music world of um, you know playing and learning and then later on in high school trying to work uh, with my friends and bands and stuff which didn't end up working out for whatever reason and I remember just be being really frustrated being like man no one wants to meet up for band practice today my drummer's like he wants to dip out and go hang out with his girlfriend this afternoon I could just never like get any of my friends together to, to like stick with it so I was just like you know what forget this I'm gonna buy a drum machine uh. yeah so I was just like you know what the drum machine's not going to tell me no it's not gonna you know it's just like I, maybe I don't need these people maybe I can just start making this music on my own and um I was mm. already starting to listen to a lot of electronic music at that point this is probably like 15 16 years old and I started to shift my focus away from like the band idea and then kind of be like well why don't I just like I like all kinds of different music and the music that was speaking to me the most at the time was electronic music. And a lot of that stuff was, was entirely composed by people doing it on their own. Mm -hmm. And that really, really was, I was really fascinated with that idea. It's like this whole DIY, like you could just do it all yourself. You know, if you just learn the gear, get, get the kit, figure out how to put it together. You know, it was a very different time. We're, we're talking, you know, early nineties when I started putting all this stuff together. So I, I was buying a lot of, equipment from secondhand shops, pawn shops. So I was buying a lot of early like analog Roland XOX series machines like the 808, 909, 303. Um, these machines were really cheap because no one wanted them in the early nineties. There was Bam, this big yes. shift to use things that were, everyone was using, was starting to, you know, wanted to use Pro Tools. They wanted realistic sounding instruments and workstations. No one wanted these analog simulations of sound, you know, trying to emulate real things, um, which at the time was very uncool, but in the electronic underground world, those were, those were the machines that a lot of my favorite uh, composers were using. So I was seeking out these machines and studying them and uh, buying them for very cheap prices. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now they're not cheap anymore, but, um, but I still have a lot of those. Uh, I still have a lot of those original devices that I, I had that I bought when I was 17. I still have my 303 that I bought that I had since I was 16, 17, my ARP 2600 I bought when I was 17 years old and I still have that. Um, so, you know, I've had these machines for over 20 years, 25 years here in my studio and they, they still work just as good as they did. Uh, well, I did, like I said, I've had some renovations and some updates done to them, but you know, they, they were great for me. It was, um, it was a really great experience for me to buy these things and learn these instruments because um, I had the time, you know, it's just living at my parents' house. I had no responsibilities. I mean, I did have a girlfriend. She also took some of my time as well, <laughs> but um, you know, I, I, I had, you know, nothing else to get in my way, really. It was just a time to explore and learn about how these synthesizers worked, how they connected together, how to make music with them. Um, so that's what I did. I, back then I recorded on a DAP machine, which I'm sure most people today are probably like, what's a DAP machine? Digital audio tape recorder. So I used to record on these little mag magnetic two hour tapes. And I, I, you know, I have like probably like five cases and they were all like two hour tapes and I would fill them up with just all these songs that I would record and make. And back then I wasn't recording on a computer. I was sequencing with actual hardware sequencers that were a, a combination of DIN sync, MIDI, and control voltage, CV and gate. So a lot of those early instruments, uh, you know, they were pre-MIDI. So I was using like the ARP sequencer, the Roland MC4. They were all, you know, using uh, control voltage signals to, you know, translate pitch, in, pitch information and other control information. And even the way that you stored the data was very archaic, it was Store, like I would store my patterns on a tape and a, a tape expander that would store the data bits and then you know off my mc4 rolling sequencer and it just the stuff that I had to do I remember back then just to be able to like replay a track right is like you would look at like, if you were like looked back in time and saw what I had to do you would be like oh my god that's like caveman style <laughs> stuff that you guys had to do to, to make music you know um, but to achieve the sound I wanted, because I wanted to use these vintage machines because they had such a unique sound signature, that's basically just what I had to go through. But, um, but like I said, it was a very unique upbringing and 
way to sort of get into electronic music and experience electronic music and learn about it um, on my own because there wasn't the internet. Right. I had magazines. I had to go to I had to go to a bunch of shows and you know look on stage and be like, why do they have an Emacs to what is an Emacs to? And it's like, what's an Akai S thirty two hundred? So I'd be sitting there writing these things down and like trying to pee. It was very like mysterious. Like, all right, I've got one piece of the puzzle, so that's a sampler. What does a sampler do? You know, and then it was just you know a lot of like little things that you would pick up at going to various shows, reading. Um, you know, articles, and magazines at the time or books and stuff. So the, the information didn't come to me as quickly as, you know, now you go to the internet, there's, you know, YouTube tutorials and stuff all over online. You could type in any subject on music making um, or getting into the music industry or anything that you want. There's, there's information readily available at your fingertips now. And uh, so back then it was, um, it was very difficult to get this information um, and so a lot of mystery, <laughs> a lot of, I called it mysteries, you know, um, but it kind of made it fun too. Cause then when you finally did discover something you were really, really stoked about, oh my God, I've been trying to figure this out for like months and I finally figured it out today. And it was very rewarding when you did figure out something, um, even though it, was a, it meant that you were obtaining that information at a much slower pace. <laughs> right. But it really stuck with you then. And when, what a solid foundation that you were able to build because of that. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, on the note of technology and information, I'm kind of wondering what role social media plays in your life as an artist, because that, that's actually the reason I found you and probably it's, it's a really prevalent tool in our society. So is that something that developed for you naturally, or was it very intentional um, to grow yourself that way? And that be um, a way to, for you to get your music out there? Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because I, you know, I came in into the music industry. I've been in the music industry for a while. I'm 45 years old now. And, you know, I feel like the old dad with my two kids. And um, so like, so when social media hit this, you know, when I, when I had to kind of get my grips around the whole social media thing together, it was kind of a strange thing for me because I came from a time when when we did promotions for a record, we hired a PR agency and they would do the PR and promotions and it would all go through, you know, college, you know, local uh, radio stations across the country. We would be sending out, you know, boxes of 500 to 2000 CDs to all these diff different places. We would use a whole distribution network for each country. We have our own distribution companies in Europe, Japan, Australia, South America, um, based on what record labels we were working with. So, you know, the way that the music would get to the people would be, it was very different. The model of everything was very different than it is now, you know, um, now everything can be, dig you, know, digi you know, distribution digitally, you know, instantly you could release something on Bandcamp or, you know, TuneCore, anything. And it's just there, you know, it's just like instantly there. SoundCloud, you can instantly get to your fans. Um, so I came up when it was, it took months and months for your music to come out and you had to wait, you know, for the duplication plant and mastering plant to get your record. And then we get the white labels back or the test pressings and we'd have to approve them. And then it was a whole lot of the process of then going and getting it. And then you could get it distributed out there. And it was just like very, very slow process. And the only press uh, would be magazine coverage, interviews, features, um, you know, that would be it. And that would be, so it's not very, you didn't really have this connection to your fans. They were, you're were still very much a mystery to them. Um, and it, it was interesting. It's just this one sort of sided picture of, you know, or a small like picture into the world of like this person, you know, you might get from like one magazine feature or something like that. But then when social media hit, I remember signing up for my Instagram account or Twitter or face my Facebook fan page or any of these things. And now, now we're using clubhouse. I don't know if you guys are on clubhouse, but we're, we've been using that a lot in the few uh, past month, but uh, that was like interesting. Cause you could directly put up anything that you're working on and immediately release it to your fans without having to wait and go or go through a record label. Like I always had to, um, and so I was like, wow, this is an interesting platform. And sure, like I watched a lot of how my other artist friends were using the platform. And I was like, well, why don't I use this to my advantage? You know, I do have a, 
you know, I don't have a huge following, but I have a decent following of, of fans and stuff. And, and the way that I've been using these social media tools uh, as of lately is this, I use it kind of like a testing ground where I'll release unreleased music that I'm working on, whether it's new tracks for my album or some project I'm working on. And, and it based like, you know, like my fans didn't know it, but they, they picked the tracks on my last album. They just didn't oh. know it. <laughs> so what I did is I, I utilized it and I said, okay, well, this track got five, 6,000 likes. And there were co comment after comment after comment. I'll see in the, in the comment threads, people saying, I will buy this track. If this, where, if this track is available anywhere, I will please make this available. I will buy this track right now. So I remember taking notes and taking all the data of all those tracks where those comments where people were instantly like, I will buy this. And I was like, okay, well, I know exactly out of what, I don't know how many hundreds of songs I've uploaded to Instagram. I have over like 3,400 posts up there, but there's several hundred, at least 250 tracks I've uploaded there. So they pick, they didn't realize it, but they were picking their favorite tracks. So I picked the favorite tracks that way, source the data. I was using the analytics based off that. And before that, we were using Google Analytics, which was much harder to gauge people's interest. But now when I have high engagement, I'm using those tools to kind of really be like, all right, well, I'll just give the fans exactly what they want. <laughs> it makes the process of putting together an album much easier for me because I have so much stuff I work on. It, you know, it makes the task really daunting and sure. Um, you know, I can pick stuff that, that I like, but, you know, it, why not give the fans exactly what they want and then kind of create this entire collection based off their, um, you know, b based off what they wanted. So it's, uh, it became this great, it's become a great tool for me in that aspect. And I kind of never really realized it until I started you know, applying the, the applying these rules, or I guess not really rules, but just you know, using these uh, social media platforms for that application. But you can use them for other things too. I try to use it um, also to because I work with a lot of companies, as you guys had mentioned in the intro. Like a lot of companies, uh, uh, I do a lot of beta testing for. I do a lot of sound design uh, patches and content and stuff. So they'll send me some synth or some you know, virtual, it could be a virtual synthesizer software, it could be whatever. And I'll usually get it first, I'll design sounds with it. Sometimes I help with product launches for like companies like Korg or Roland or Native Instruments. And, um, you know, I will create content that will launch at the same time as, you know, launch day or whatever, and, and, and upload some sounds that I've created for that instrument. And that's also been great too. So I use it also as like awareness for my fans that are interested in those type of those tools, I keep my channel specifically geared towards, it's like very mm. boutique, I guess. My, my channel's very boutique. It's very much centered around like experimental electronic music. If you're interested in sound design based tools or more esoteric uh, experimental based instruments and software environments that, you know, my channel will be for you, uh, you know, but it's not, it's not for everybody. I, I tell people that don't, don't feel like you have to follow me I post some pretty weird stuff all the time. Some of it might be interesting. Some of it just might sound like a bunch of garbled noise to you. So <laughs> I figure I'll just put the warning out there ahead of time. And, uh, but you know, it's, it's great. I feel that having these avenues to express yourself and have that immediate connection to your fans is really wonderful. Mm -hmm. And also you can use it as a, as a, like an educational platform to educate your fans too about new cool things that you're into. It doesn't always have to be just about, hey, this is my new, my new music track. I, you know, I could get some really crazy thing in the studio one day and be like, man, I wanna share this, this information about this really cool tool or this instrument that I find really intriguing with my fans. You might find it that may have not discovered it. And there, I can't tell you how many times I've had fans reach out to me. It's like, dude, I, I had no idea that this thing existed until you posted this. And that thing changed my life. That one piece of gear, like I bought that thing and I'm making crazy music now. And I love hearing stories like that, where people are like, you inspired me to do something like with this thing that I didn't know about, or that it's just, or it could just be an idea, like a, just a musical gesture. It could be just something that they see or hear that they get inspired for. And I'm, I'm hoping that 
and I've been trying to to make my channel more on those tips where the, you know you see something you might catch something or just like where it just becomes like this inspirational springboard to do something else. Um, so, do you uh, <laughs> did you grow your following organically? Like, did it just kind of grow over time, or was it, or were there specific campaigns that you did to try and really up your numbers of followers? Or, uh, I mean, you have a wonderful, you have a really great following. How how did it come to to be where it is now? Um, yeah, I didn't do much. It was just I kind of stuck with the same. Well, I kind of tried to figure out, like, you know, I wanted to make sure that I'm always doing engaging, cool content. And another thing was kind of like figuring out the time to time zones of like where my fans are based in the world. It was a lot of like background analytics. Like I've, I've switched my accounts. I know I did on my Facebook, um, fa Facebook fan page and on my Instagram pages, like business accounts, also my Twitter account too. So what's great about those when you switch them to a business account, even though I'm not really like selling stuff through there, what's great about switching to a business account is that it gives you the analytic tools, basically it tells you where the highest number of people are engaged in different countries. And it tells you the specific times that they're logged on at the day. So, you know, when you're going to get the highest engagement, you know, you, you have all the data there that you can look at. So you can kind of plan how you post your content to that data, which is really, really helpful um, so that you just don't end up posting stuff and no one ever sees it. So it's, it's good to kind of do a little bit of homework and try to figure out when people are on and when they're looking at their device and like checking out stuff. And, um, and once you kind of get that figured out, then you kind of can take it from there. And then, you know, on, on my channels, I try to always keep it interesting. I try to switch it up a lot so that one day you might see something totally random you've never seen before or might go to something you know it's not always constantly the same thing on every day too i want i like to keep it fun and interesting and switch things up and and um keep it you know just keep it interesting i guess yeah, i guess at least for me for sure you're, you're i love <laughs> your posts are very interesting for sure can we talk for a minute uh, about just about sign so, sorry sound design in itself um can you explain sure. to our listeners what that is exactly and what you do in that role when you're in that role yeah um wow sound design is a pretty like it's a it's a broad term that can be applied to many different applications and i guess sound design and how it's applied to my career has been many things like I've done sound design for tv commercials to um to video games to augmented to vr virtual reality environments um, spatialized audio to user interface sound design for devices like the Barnes and Noble Nook tablets I did a lot of work with them and of course you mentioned Google I just finished working with them on their Stadia uh, cloud streaming gaming service and um, or video like I said like video games like designing sound design for actual um, games whether that's like music or just like actual sound design elements that play within a score or work within the game uh, and then I mean everything from that to actually you know one of my more recent projects was designing sounds for the uh, Jaguar I-Pace electric vehicle where I collaborated with the um, Jaguar JLR in England to design every single sound that the I-Pace electric car makes, which was one of the most challenging sound design jobs I ever had to do. But that's fascinating. Um, yeah, wow. It was a crazy job. Yes. That's not a normal, not a normal project. And it was a very long, uh, brutal uh, process to get to where we were or where we got it to where we could actually, you know, there was a lot of stuff. Do you work with them? Sorry to interrupt you, Richard. Do you work with them to uh, to um, figure out what the sound is going to be and then how it is going to how it's going to make that sound as well? Or are you just just on tones and stuff? Or are you like kind of the whole process? It was everything. Yeah, we. Ba I basically started from you know from ground zero. We had to figure this out. I started the project in 2011 with them. I worked on several prototype vehicles for them that were never released publicly. Um, we had to figure this out. And I remember there was, I didn't know any other sound designers at the time that were faced with this, this sort of, <laughs> the sort of problem that I was faced with. And it all stemmed from a legislative law that got passed in 2011 in the UK that all electric vehicles had to emit a, a, what they called an exterior warning sound. 
So it didn't mean that, you know, they had to like this, make this warning alert beep sound, but it had to emulate because most of the uh, electric vehicles at that time that were coming out, they're all virtually silent. You couldn't hear them at all coming through a parking lot. So the problem with that is for people that can't see that are blind or, you know, have hearing disabilities or their vision disabilities, they, um, they need to be able to hear this vehicle coming through the parking lot. There were, there were quite a few lawsuits um, that had happened because of there were so many accidents because these people couldn't hear the cars coming. So they changed the law and that got passed. And from that, you know, they had to figure out, well, great. Now we have to figure we have to put speakers outside in the car. Now we have to do research on what type of speakers those will be, how, and because in the legislative uh, documentation said that the sound had to project at a specific distance. I think it was like almost a hundred feet away so that it could give enough time for the you know, pedestrian to move off into the sidewalk while the vehicle's coming down the road. Um, so there were a lot of logistic things that we had, to, I had to figure out um, working with these strange speakers that had very limited frequency response. It wasn't like working on like normal studio monitors or anything like that. These are very, di very different kind of speakers. Um, and it was a completely different system too. So I had to develop, create a, a synthesized based system that would, that they had to recode and create and put into this computer, into the car. Um, so I had to figure out how to develop the system too. I was like, cause I just didn't know. I was like, well, I worked with Microsoft on, you know, the Forza racing games. And I was like, so I know, I kind of know how maybe the mechanics of this might work based off that. Cause I remember using FMOD. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with FMOD, but that's a, um, basically an algorithmic based environment where they design video games in uh, like unity or any of these other environments. Um, you know, you, you basically work with these different algorithmic sets and I was using a driving simulation algorithm that they design a lot of racing games with. So I looked at that first. I was like, well, I can look at this as a model and figure out the mechanics of how this works first before I actually go in and design something myself. I wanted to just understand the basic core of how, how, to manip how the user would manipulate the audio in an environment like that. So I took a bit of time to wrap my head around. And once I got that, I was able to develop my first prototype. Um, and then I also did this big engine analysis study where I went back and you know, I recorded all of the current um, Jaguar vehicles because the client had requested, uh, as per, per their marketing team, wanted to have some trace of the past of some of the combustion-based vehicles. So they didn't want their customers to get into the new car and be like, whoa, this is such an alien, completely different departure than what we're used to. They wanted to have some trace of the past, but somehow having one foot forward. So what I did was I resynth I recorded all the engines and I resynthesized them using resynthesis technology, using the Kima system and uh, some other software that I had here. And I basically did what I called a harmonic cluster study. So I was studying the harmonics that the, that the engine would create at different RPMs, at, you know, different at high wow. rates, at low rates. And I took all that data and then I basically set that all up in these spreadsheets. And then I looked at all that data and I was like, okay, it's interesting. I'm starting to see some common things here, especially in the harmonics where they're sitting at. And I was able to take that data and resynthesize that and then pull that into, utilize that and, and, and integrate that into the newer sounds that I was creating for them, for the new models I was creating for the IPA. So um, yeah, it was a really fascinating project, but it was, Indeed. yeah, like I think people don't realize some of the crazy stuff that I do and, and my day job is pretty nuts. You know, they <laughs> might see what I, what I do at night, like in my studio, but a lot of the projects I work on in the daytime are pretty. Wow. That uh, is fascinating. Uh, totally fascinating. Crazy. Wow. Can I ask you what sort of training um what sort of training you've had uh, to get to prepare you for a career like that and what sort of um, career training somebody might uh, seek out if they're wanting to enter that field? Well, uh, it's, it's funny. I haven't had any training. I went to school for graphic design. I got a BFA and or I got my bachelor's in fine arts. Um, yeah, like graphic design. Never did anything with my degree. Um, I haven't even designed even one of my own record covers. I always have other artists to it. So it's really funny. Like my music was already paying for my school. It's funny. It was, I was traveling a lot in college, uh, playing shows, doing tours. I would literally come in 
my class from the airport with my luggage and my gear to make it into my class, my college classes. My, and my teachers be like, where'd you just come? It's like, I just came in from Athens, Greece, or I'd be in like <laughs> Milan, Italy, or like Tokyo, or, you know, like Melbourne, Australia. I remember I flew back from Melbourne playing a tour there and like coming back completely just hadn't slept in like, you know, like six days coming back to class just so I could have my attendance. I mean, my teachers were just like, how are you doing? This is absolutely, you're absolutely insane. I was like, well, I gotta get, I gotta get my degree. But I remember thinking, I was like, my dad was like, I mean, he said some things like, Rich, you know, you're already, you've already made it. You're like in college. I mean, you should just finish and get your degree. I'm not going to stop you from doing that, but it's pretty obvious that you've already made, you're already making it with music. You're already paying for your school. You've already bought cars and things that these other students haven't even bought yet with your music already. And it's, you know, I think that you should just probably stay doing this, you know I mean? I, I, but I felt weird about it. I was like, but I love doing this and I, I'm already getting <laughs> paid money to do this. It feels wrong. Like I would do this for free, you know? And yeah. like, and it was just such a weird thing. Cause like all my friends were like getting these degrees and getting these like normal office jobs or working at like some design agencies or doing stuff like that. And here I was just like traveling the world, playing shows and like living this very different lifestyle, which felt to me as a young college student, I was like, am I on the right path? Am I really like on the right path here? Or, you know, you just, because I just didn't know anyone else that was doing that, that was close to me, you know, that, that was making those sort of decisions kind of scary in a way when you think about it. It's like, am I going to be able to buy a house and support a family and do all these things that like have all these things that other people have, like health insurance and all these other things by, by going into music? Is, is it possible? And for me, it happened. I don't know how I did it, but I was able to do it. And that's when my parents were like, okay, yeah, you've, you've made it. You should probably pursue doing this and keep stay on this road. And, but I'm not going to lie and say it wasn't feeling kind of weird about it, you know? Um, Cause I wasn't making like top of the pop music at all either too. So it wasn't like, you know, I, I, I knew for sure that, you know, I wasn't going to be this, you know, making millions or anything, but it was kind of one of those things where I was like, I could do okay right now, but mm -hmm. you know, what, what's the future going to hold, you know, kind of one of, one of those things. So yeah, it's a very interesting position to be in, oh, um, but yeah, it worked out for me. I don't know how, but it's, it, and it's always worked out some way or another. And, you know, I'm very, I feel very blessed that I get to do uh, the things that I get to do and work with the companies and stuff and projects. And yeah, that's really a blessing. Very cool I, job. I, yeah. And then I've even been here th this long too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Richard, thank you so much for being here with us. I kind of want to ask you, uh, we have one thing that we do every episode with our guests um, mm -hmm. called Desert Island Albums. But just before that, I wanted to ask you, is there one thing or two things that you would want to leave off with the next generation of young musicians, some piece of advice that you would give them? Maybe even, because um, obviously you went from being a child taking piano lessons to being very successful. So for that middle ground, is there a few tips you might give a young person for how they kind of break into the industry? Yeah, um, I think one of the most important things that a lot of people forget is that at least it, it, what it worked out for me is that you try to create something where it's your own unique signature style, your trademark thing that is uniquely your own thing. And, you know, I have a lot of friends that try to follow trends where they just follow, they'll get into the music industry, they find a genre that they like, and they just try to sound just like the person they love. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's I, I think you can learn a lot from trying to emulate other people's styles and stuff. But at some point you should take all that knowledge and maybe put a little twist on things, you know, like your own personal twist of like, maybe just uh, like for me, it's, it was like a, as a combination of different influences that kind of gave my sort of sound what it is today. Like all these things that I grew up listening to multiple different artists from, you know, different genres and styles of music and different approaches that kind of influence the way that I write music and that I'd studied growing up. And, um, and the most important thing that I, I pulled out from all that is they all like had this, all the people that I really, really like, they always like the second the music would come on, you knew right away who it was. And I was just like, you know, I think that's really important. You know, you think of like any artist, um, 
there's no one like them. You know, sure, there could be someone that could sound similar to them, but you know, like the real unique people out there in the, the music business world, like they're that's it. They're they're it. You know, you think of like, I don't know, I'm trying to make this like say Prince, for example. Prince is Prince. There's nobody that's gonna prince or herbie hancock i know like i love my huge herbie hancock fan like sure there's a lot of great players and stuff but like i listen to herbie's records i'm like there's nobody that can do stuff like herbie herbie's like he just that's him you know like and you know i i try to think of that i think the best advice is like you you have to find your own voice and i think the sooner you find that you're in turn like what you are about like the the better off you're going to be like the earlier on that you can figure out that i think is really key and sticking with that you know, there might be some ups and downs to that. There be a, might be a lot of people that might not understand what you're doing. Um, but you just, you got to just, if you believe in it and that's what you feel in your heart and it's close to you and that's like the stuff that you want to do, you should just go for it. And, you know, regardless of what people say, whatever the haters are going to say about it, you know, because uh, I had haters too in the beginning to, you know, like going and I still, even to this day too, you just got to go with your heart and do it, do what you love to do. And like, that's, I think it speaks more volumes than just trying to chase the most current musical trend, which a lot of, believe it or not, I know a lot of people that do that. They're just, current, you know, chasing current musical trends, trying to sound like the most trendy in thing at the moment. And you, I think you should just do you if that's what you want, you know. <laughs> that's great advice. You know, Richard, you've carved out a very cool niche spot in music itself. I, I really respect what you do. I think it's, it's amazing. I, I'm curious um, as to some of your influences and, and, and um, artists that got you to where you are now. Could you share with us, uh, if you had, uh, if you were on a desert island, there was five albums uh, or five artists that you need to listen to. Who are, who are, who are your favorites? Who, are, who do people need to listen to? Wow. Um, well, I'd say number one is uh, an artist named Morton Sabotnik. Morton was a uh, hugely influential electronic composer. He's still alive today. I think he's 95 or 96 years old, but uh, his records I got at a very young age, probably around age 16, 17. I inherited these records from a friend of mine who was a synth tech here and completely blown away when I heard his music. I never heard anything like it. It was, um, the best way I could describe it was like painting with watercolors, like audio watercolors. Like the, wow. there was nothing linear about the music. It wasn't made on typical machines. He was using um, these synthesizers that were created by this, this um, I would say Don Buchla, uh, who created, or Buchla and Associates from San Francisco. Um, they were primarily what they called West Coast synth based synthesis, synthesizer company. And Morton used these synths and they were extremely expensive. Only universities would have them. They were what really, years really are we great. talking about? What year would he have been releasing music? Uh, this is like, oh, it's some of his early, it's 1960s, 70s. You know, wow. this is pretty early on. Yeah, pretty early stuff. This this wasn't anything new. And even at the time when I got the records, this, this stuff was already pretty old. Um, so I, I, I didn't know music even existed like this. And this, it blew me away. Like I said, when, when I heard it, it was, it, it just sounded like someone painting is very abstract. And there, there wasn't any sort of linear sequence sequencing to it. It felt very free and just, it was very gestural. Like there was no constraints. And I just never heard music like that before. It really changed my perception of what music could even be. And like people might even question those albums like Sidewinder and Silver Apples of the Moon were some of these first albums I was that I had gotten from Morton. Um, you know, some people might even question is if it is if it is even music. Um, but to me, it was very musical. It was very advanced music. The concepts were just so far ahead of everything else that I was listening to. I didn't realize that even a thing existed. Uh, until I listened to it and it was uh, it really it, like I said it just it was such a profound thing to discover as a young teenager at that point in time I was like wow I just I thought I was listening to the coolest music but I, I was I, I wasn't hmm. there's music that had come out 20 years before this by these crazy people that like John Cage or Stockhausen I remember when I heard the the contact record and I was like is this this sounds like music from like a mentally insane person. Like 
I, I just never, I, you know what I mean? It was like, if there was like a crazy person, I never, it never crossed my mind. It was like, well, I, I, that idea is like, well, well yeah. I mean, who, wh what is the purpose of this music? This music is so unusual. And, you know, there's like found sounds and all these different sort of weird, I, I can't even, I, I, the first time I heard that record, I remember just sitting there just in my, I mean, he's using my parents' record player. And I remember like putting on, Stockhausen's contact and just being like this is so disturbing it's incredible like <laughs> I didn't know I could feel this with music like do you know what I mean like your typical music is always going to make you feel these these typical emotions that everyone wants mm -hmm. to experience falling in love and sadness and breakups and all the typical stuff that you normally experience in music but you never rarely put on a record and be like okay there's something wrong with this person <laughs> Uh-huh. Interesting. There's something right. There's something not quite right about this person. And I absolutely love that. I was like, okay, these people might have something a little bit not right in their head. And they create this art that's completely in some other space, in some other realm. And it was, it was so intriguing to me. I was like, wow, this is fascinating that this even exists. I had no idea this was even a genre or this was even, you know, that this was even possible. And it just kind of like opened the doors of anything being possible. Anything could be, you know, anything could be music. It yeah. didn't necessarily have to follow a certain, you know, you know, formula or, you know, pattern that, you know, that a lot of my friends were trying to chase at the time. They were all chasing these specific genres that were all based on these formulaic patterns and things and instruments they all had to be the same because the records had to mix into each other because of uh for whatever reason you know but i was, I was like i want to go out i want to go in this direction and explore what what there is possible and uh yeah it's it really changed me and you know so many went this thing those artists really just really res completely reset my brain and What's his last name again? Mort Morton Sabotnik. Sabotnik. Cool. <laughs> Interesting. Mm. Mm -hmm. Who else do we need to listen to? Else do who else need to people need to check out? Yeah, I mean, I'd say those early records like John Cage was also huge. Um, I was hugely influential. Like he was another artist where um, you know, anything could be used as a musical instrument. It didn't matter. There was no you know, using a traditional piano or, you know, um, you know, like Stockhouse and he used a bunch of helicopters. He had a, an album called Helicopter Quartet. We actually had these helicopters flying around, was recording them and like, uh, you know, just these completely crazy abstract concepts, you know, for instrumentation, for composition. They're very radical ideas where I was just like, wow, this is really where it's at, you know? Um, why do we always have to use the same traditional instruments to make music? You know, we don't have to use a guitar, drums, and and it made me really think about that stuff. In my own music, it's like, yeah, well, why? Why I don't have to do that either. I could switch up the comp completely switch up the palette. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same thing. It doesn't have to be. I don't have to use the same instrument that's been used for centuries to create this sort of emotion or sound or whatnot. I can use whatever I want. But yeah, a lot of those artists were 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 big for me, um, and they were using very crude technology like you know, reel to reel tapes and oscillators and these, you know, to, to create some of these records, it was a very tedious laborious process of tape splicing and to create some of these things, you know, stuff that we don't have to worry about doing now because we don't have to worry about that stuff. But it's the stuff that they did was was fascinating to me. It had this very organic quality. And uh, one, another artist I really liked is Todd Dockstader. He's uh, passed away, but uh, he did a lot of incredible uh, tape works with tape splicing and, um, and just absolutely incredible, organic, strange. It's like music from Forbidden Planet or something. It was just, you know, just so out there and exotic and different and unique. And I just never, uh, you never heard anything like that. I remember hearing his music for the first time, like I'd heard Morton's music, just the same feelings like, wow, here's another person that's really just not going with the grain you know what I mean it's and it's such an awesome thing it's really inspiring to see these artists that are really abstracting the art so much they're just they're doing this whole other thing that's just their own thing on it you know it's like their own world of stuff and that to me is that spoke to me the most 
Um, and given their technology, just the amount of effort that had to go into uh, actually putting that music together is, is quite impressive in itself. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the stuff that they had to go through to, to achieve those recordings, like I said, even when I was talking about earlier about the stuff I had to do, they even had to struggle even more because the tools were even more primitive at the time. And the mm-hmm. fact that they were able to get the results that they were is just, like you said, it's astonishing to me that that that, that's that incredible. So mm-hmm. I still salute them. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Richard, for sharing the, sharing those names and, and imparting some wisdom on our listeners. We sure appreciate your time. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, yeah. no problem. No problem. Thanks so much. I look, I look forward to uh, more watch, checking out more of your crazy posts. Yes, yes, they're, they'll <laughs> still they'll still keep coming. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, man. All righty, you guys have a great night. Thanks. You too. Bye. Bye.